this channel, I discuss the evidence for the interpretation of hell as the final annihilation of the penitent lost rather than eternal torment. In that series of live stream presentations, I spent three entire episodes defending annihilationism. The fact of the matter is, there is so much evidence in the Bible for annihilationism that I had to be selective with what evidence I talked about. However, as expected, I got pushback for that particular position of the series, and even in parts of the video that dealt with other issues of hell, like the problem of the unevangelized, I got many questions and pushback about my annihilationist views in the live chat of the comment section of those videos. Unexpectedly, though, most of the pushback mostly came from universalists, though, rather than traditionalists. Some people mistakenly think that the case for annihilationism rests solely on passages that say that the wicked will die, be destroyed, be killed, or some variation thereof. And if passages like these were all we annihilationists had to go on, our case would be substantially weaker. In truth, a lot of the most powerful evidence for annihilationism comes n not from repeated destruction language, but illustrations and word pictures that the prophets, Jesus, and the New Testament epistle writers used to describe what will happen to the damned. In his book, Holy Smoke, The Myth of Endless Torment, Brother Bird has an entire chapter on this titled, The Pictures in the Scriptures, which is where I got the idea for this video title. So let's look at a handful of these pictures in the scriptures that, unless annihilationism were true, would be really bad analogies of final punishment. Picture 1, Sodom and Gomorrah as an example. This is one word picture I already mentioned here on the channel. I brought it up in part 2 of my Hell series on Cerebral Faith Live. 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 and Jude 7 both speak of Sodom and Gomorrah as being reduced to ashes as an example of what awaits the finally impenitent. If either eternal conscious torment or universalism were true, then the Apostle Peter and Jude are making a gigantic disanalogy. Sodom and Gomorrah's reduction to ashes would be nothing like what's going to happen to the ungodly. Unless, of course, Peter and Jude imagined that what Abraham saw when he got up and looked the next day were people wallowing around screaming in agony in a, in a fire, not being able to escape as per the eternal torment view, or with some escaping the flames, repenting and becoming faithful Yahweh followers as per the universalist view. But that's not what Abraham saw, as Genesis 19 makes clear. Genesis chapter 19 verses 27 to 28 says, quote, Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace." End quote. Picture 2. Burning up the chaff with fire. As Brother Bird writes, quote, There's something in the fire, and these items swiftly and completely burn up especially in a fire that can't be put out. Something is definitely in the fire. Still get the picture? Where There's the fire. Where's the chaff, or the stubble, or the tares? Truth is, I, it's just, there is no imagery of fire, not fire alone. It is imagery of objects in fire. Something is definitely in the fire." End quote. Brother Berg goes on to cite a few verses. In Matthew 3.12, John the Baptist says of Jesus that, quote, he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, end quote. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 40, Jesus says, quote, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world, end quote. And in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 8, we read, quote, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned." End quote. In these three verses, we have pictures of final punishment as sinners being thrown into a fire to be burned up, illustrated by chaff and wheat being thrown into a fire to burn. Bird writes, quote, "...that's the deciding factor of the context and of the occurrence, and doesn't in turn know how to expertly illustrate and his images of those kinds of objects in that kind of fire perfectly picture consumption, not torment. Get the picture? Fire consumes. Fire alone could possibly, but not necessarily, picture pain, but incendiary items in an indis inextinguishable inferno couldn't and doesn't. 
Picture 3. Corpses being eaten by maggots and worms. Ironically, Mark 9.48 is used as a proof text for eternal torment. In this verse, Jesus says that people in hell are burned with a fire that isn't quenched, and they're eaten by maggots that will not die. The problem, though, is that Jesus is directly quoting Isaiah 66.24, where it is the corpses of God's enemies being eaten by maggots and consumed by fire, not living people in torment. Even earlier in the chapter, to which Jesus is quoting, God says, See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with his sword the Lord will execute judgment on all people, and many of those will be slain by the Lord. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15 to 16. Then, in verses 22 to 24, we get a vision of the eschaton. Quote, as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and your descendants endure. From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die, the fire that burns them will not be quenched, and they will be loathsome to all mankind." End quote. God's enemies will be slain, verses 15 to 16. Hence, the dead bodies that the righteous will look upon, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. How in the world do you explain God's eschaton describing his enemies as dead if, in fact, they will be made immortal, never to die again? In verses 43 to 45, prior to quoting Isaiah 66, 24 in Mark 9, 48, Jesus said, quote, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed with, than with two feet to be thrown into hell." End quote. The alternative to being thrown into an unquenchable fire is to enter life. But again, if either universalism or eternal torment were true, everyone would enter life. Hell would not be a contrast to entering life. It would just be an alternative to entering life of a pleasant kind. Jesus here seems to be talking about body parts and the incentive to cut them off in order to avoid hell as akin to a doctor amputating gangrenous limbs to save the life of a person. Better to lose an infective leg than to lose your life. Better to live missing one leg than to be dead. Now, one universalist in the comments section of one of my videos pointed to Targum Isaiah, which shows the idea that worms were a symbol of breaths. The significance of this, he argued, is that it showed that this idea existed in Jesus' day. That's why, that's, that's true, I'm not denying that, but all the evidence we have points to Jesus and the disciples reading the Greek Septuagint as their translation, not the Targum. The Septuagint, or LXX, would therefore be a more reasonable source to go to. And in fact, it is in the Septuagint of Isaiah 66:24 that Jesus quotes in Mark 9:48, making the Targum interpretation all but useless. The Targums are Aramaic paraphrases of the Hebrew Scriptures. Frankly, I feel the force of an argument based on such paraphrases as if you were to mount an interpretive argument from a passage of the Living Bible. They're not inspired, and there's no evidence that the New Testament authors read them, them over the Septuagint. So the fact that Targum Isaiah has tormented zombies doesn't affect the force of my argument. Conclusion Many more word pictures of final punishment could have been given in this video, but to prevent this video from becoming as long as my live streams and giving myself tons of editing work to do, I will leave it here. What do you think? Do these pictures in the scriptures make any sense on any view of hell except annihilationism? I welcome discussion in the comments section below. If you liked the video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content and turn on notifications so you'll be notified whenever I have new content out, be they live streams or uploads like this one. Peace out, God bless, and keep using the brains that God gave you.